Hello, everybody. Welcome to part three of our reading of the return of the divine Sophia. If you are watching this on Rumble, just like the Magdalene manuscript yesterday, this is the first time I'm posting any of the Magdalene series on my Rumble channel. So if this is your first time exploring these topics, I would definitely suggest going down into the description box to find the full playlist, which will bring you to my YouTube channel so that you can get backup information. So you're not starting in the middle of, or, you know, towards the middle of, of a research topic that we've been working on for quite a while. This is actually my second time recording part three. Um, I just kind of felt like I needed to redo this one because of everything that's gone on over these last couple of weeks. I know I haven't, I haven't put up a Sophia recording in a couple of weeks. And I do know that even though these tend to be some of my lowest viewed um, videos, I do know that this is some of the most important videos that, that I have on my channel. This topic is so important because I think a lot of us do know here in this great awakening that it's not really about politics. It's not really about medicine. It's not really about education. Those are just symptoms of the greater whole. The crux of this great awakening is spirituality, is understanding or starting to get a better understanding of where we've been lied to, where we're confused about who we really are. And again, if you are following the law of one, we do know that at this time period in our cosmo cosmic history, planet Earth is ascending from third density to fourth density. Which fourth density? We don't know yet. Probability is that we'll go fourth density positive and not fourth density negative. So let me just make that very clear. We are ascending. That is a given. The earth has to ascend. But which direction it goes is still up to the collective consciousness of this planet. And that's why it's super, super, super important that we really start to dive into our own spirituality so that we start to understand our responsibility and our role in this time in our history. We were not put here by mistake for this transition. According to the law of one, this is one of the first times in history of the cosmos that a planet has transferred from third density to fourth density with living creatures on it. Usually when a human being ascends or a planet ascends for a planet, all the living beings have to get off the planet first for the planet to ascend and for humans to ascend, usually we have to die first and then ascend into our next life. It's the first time that we've been able to do this while riding the planet as it is as it ascends and while being in human form and in human body ourselves and so it is of dire dire straits right now that we really start to get in touch with ourselves spiritually on an individual le level that we stop playing follow the leader when it comes to spirituality we stop when we start listening to our own self and to our own gut and start to understand the complexity of who we are as i say complexity but really God, source, creator works in common sense. And so um, it has been a privilege for me to be able to go through all of this text with you, starting with the missing books of the Bible and now into understanding the playlist, understanding the Magdalene, which does include Magdalene's manuscript or the Magdalene manuscript, Magdalene's gospel, which we, we read Megan Watterson's um, commentary on that gospel, the Sophia Code and now Return of the Divine Sophia. Um, as many of you know, the word Magdalene means chalice. It means womb. And as many of you know, the, the person we call Mary Magdalene has been one of my main, main guides. She's spoken to me my whole life. Many of you see her in, on camera with me, and I always say that this is her playlist. She is the one that, that pushed me to start doing this on this channel. And when we talk about understanding the Magdalene, not only are we briefly speaking about the person known as Magdalene, but we're also speaking about the return of divine feminine. And that divine feminine isn't just with women. That also encompasses the divine feminine that is alive in masculines as well. Because we, as we know, as I believe, we have not been in a patriarchal society. We have been in a Luciferian society because the patriarchal society cannot exist without the matriarchal society. They are two of the same equal ends. And so understanding the Magdalene means we're coming to a place where we understand who we are and where we're supposed to go in the future to rebalance everything. And part of that is understanding this concept of Sophia, the feminine energy of God. All right. So with that being said, this is part three of Return of the Divine Sophia, which we are going to be reading chapter four today. And chapter four starts with part two, the journey. Soul of my soul, heart of my heart. I hear you. I long for you. I follow you. Through all the shadows into the light, you are with me, though I know it not. 
You have never forsaken me, not once, though I have lost my way. You are the question and the answer, the song and the calling. And if I can only remember who you are, then I will remember my name. Chapter four, the great medicine circle and the four gates of heaven. The grail of the feminine urges us to open our minds to a new vision of reality, a revelation of all cosmic life as a divine unity. It is to be born into a world lit by an invisible radiance, ensouled by divine presence, graced and sustained by incandescent light and love. Andrew Harvey and Anne Baring, The Divine Feminine. Five years had passed since I had been to that magical little house in the forest. And I saw as I stepped out of the car that Shasta's cottage had barely changed. The crisp golden leaves of late Indian summer sparkled against the blue sky and I could feel the pull of the grove's wild beauty calling. I was here to ask Shasta to convene a sacred circle for me for I was ready to study with her. I felt that for all the knowledge that I had gained, there were questions that perhaps only she could answer. I took my time walking to the far side of the house, feeling the sacred energies gathered in the grove. I saw that Shasta had added an, a herb garden to her vegetable garden beside the house. And from the top of the hill, I could see new sanctuaries hidden amid the foliage. Statues of goddesses and arbors of honeysuckle hid secret alcoves. The fire pit that lay at the lowest point of the medicine circle was now half hidden by kudzu, and there were no sign of the three cauldrons I had seen years earlier. I wondered idly what had become of them. I made my way to a cluster of chairs and waited for Shasta to join me. I suspected that she knew why I'd called. A flock of butterflies fluttered around me, a symbol of transformation and change. Well, perhaps these butterflies knew more than I did, for whatever happened now would certainly change my life forever. Shasta came out of the house with two large mugs of tea. She handed me one in silence and led the way down towards the fire pit towards the medicine circle. She drew me wordlessly to the eastern altar and we stood before a marble slab that had been raised several feet into the air to create a platform. Upon it stood a life-size statue of an Asian woman draped in gold. Beside this was a smaller statue of Isis with her outstretched wings. And then completing the Trinity was the medium-sized statue of Mother Mary. She let me have a moment to breathe it all in, and then she began. In the goddess path, all ceremony is done in a sacred circle. That is because the circle is the totality of the all. The circle is not hierarch hierarchical. It is cyclical, like the universe. Everything moves in a circle. The seasons, the planets, the constellations in the sky. We are all part of this sacred circle. And this is why sites like Stonehenge and Averbury were laid out in a circle. The path of the circle, the goddess of all, links us to the heartbeat of the cosmos. She let those words seek in and I felt myself falling back into connection with something I had known long ago. In the sacred language of light, the circle with a cross at the center is the symbol for the soul. It is also the symbol used in astrology for planet Earth, telling us that we are all linked to Mother Earth from the very beginning. Native Americans call this the Great Medicine Circle, a symbol for balance and mastery. They believe that all people are flawed in some way, thus the Medicine Circle, which is connected to the Great Mystery, the source of all things gives us a way to come back into balance with ourselves and heal our wounds. I followed her words carefully. I knew some of this, of course, but I have never heard it put this way. The four arms of the cross represented the four elements, the four directions, and of course, the four aspects of our natures, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. In the union of all four of these elements, mastery is found. Shasta went on. When you enter a sacred circle, you begin in the east and travel sunwise or clockwise. The east is the gate of new beginnings, the place of the rising sun and of illumination. It is the place of hope where Mary the mother sits, the virgin at the beginning of time. It is the place where Horus arises with his great wings of truth, turning the universe. It is the home of the sweet goddess of love. I nodded. 
taking in the bowl of pink roses on the open altar. It is said that long ago, during the time of Atlantis, the earth spun in the opposite direction and the sun rose in the western gate. But now we travel the circle sunwise as the light moves in the sky. That is very, very fascinating that she just said that, that during Atlantis, the sun rose in an opposite direction. Because as you guys know, it's been spoken about on this channel and other channels that it does appear that the sun is actually changing, that it's rising from the north now and setting into the south. So that's fascinating. If that marks um, a new timeline, that's really interesting. That she, she said that because that does, again, connect with stuff we're seeing now as we shift into a new, a new reality. I was not completely surprised by what she said. I had studied the legends of Atlantis, Lumeria, and Tibet and knew the theories about the magnetic pole shifts. Scientists have now discovered that the magnetic poles of our planet have reversed many times during the Earth's long, convoluted history. Sometimes this pole reversal is gentle, and sometimes it's catastrophic. Was it possible that such reversals had actually caused the change in the rising position of the sun? Shasta continued. There are only a few shamans who can work the wheel counterclockwise, and these are usually Celtic or Native American medicine people. That's interesting, too, because Celtic people are Kentuckian. Um, you've heard me speak about this a lot recently. Um, this came up with the issue with, um, for those on Rumble, I'm sorry, I have to say it this way because YouTube, there is censorship. So um, the unicorn country, if you know what I mean, the country that starts with a U, that's on the news quite recently on a board posting apparently there is a portal in kiev and this is where the kentuckian people were brought in after their planet was destroyed by the draco so kentuckian i'm not saying kentucky people are getting very confused by that kentucky is actually a french word that comes from the louisiana purchase i'm talking about kentucky the kentuckian the kentuckians from the planet kentucky so these would be what we would call our nordic people would be the kentuckians so this is the celtic culture this is the druid culture this is the anglo-saxon culture this is the scandinavian culture the blonde-haired blue-eyed we know the blonde-haired blue-eyed are kentuckian as well as palladian so that's interesting that she's saying the celtics could do this the shamans in celtic culture do the counterclockwise because that's kentuckian and the native americans which are a different star seed system altogether but we do know some native americans were also white as well we've learned that our history has been very very much not what we think it is very much changed so it's interesting she she talks about this because that shows you how we are so greatly linked to other galaxies where we learned this magical stuff from other galaxies and then of course a lot of our ancestors from other galaxies were brought here to planet earth to be a part of this prison planet after the draco destroyed their planets, the planet Lyra was destroyed, which I know people have told me my soul comes from Lyra. I'm, I'm Lyran. Um, even though I know I have both Kentuckian and Palladian DNA, I am, my soul is Lyran. Um, you know, that, that just shows you how, how drastic of a battle this has been with, between the Draco that the Pleiades, some of the Pleiades were also destroyed by the Draco. And so that is why planet earth is a battleground for all these different galactic beings and us as earthlings, from what I understand, we are the most powerful in the, in the galaxy because we are a combination of so many different galactic people, right? We're not just of this earth. We are also a multitude of other star systems, which makes us incredibly powerful. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that is very riveting that she said that because it does, again, have to do with a lot that's happening now. All right. They are shamans who walk backwards and thus unwind karma. I teach my students to travel from east to west in a circle, honoring the natural harmony of life. As I study the eastern altar, my eyes drink in the red and golden candles, the ribbons on the trees, and the sweet fragrance of roses. I could indeed sense a presence here. Shasta watched me carefully. I wondered why Mary and Isis were on the same altar. Mary and Isis are one, she murmured, as if reading my mind. These are the sweet goddess of compassion and wisdom. I gave her a puzzled look. Mary and Isis are one? Just what did that mean? Isis is the template for Mary. The first images of Isis holding her son Horus are templates for the Madonna and child. Both Isis and Mary are mothers of compassion who brought saviors into the world in a time of darkness, not saviors, teachers. 
no one can save you but yourself. That is something that I disagree with. Thinking that there is a savior is what keeps us on a negative path. We have to do our own work. They were teachers. And Mary was the incarnation of Isis. They are the same soul. So that does make sense. We talked about that in the Sophia Code as well. The idea of the great cosmic play seems to be at work here. I thought as if these vast archetypal energies come again and again into the world to act out similar dramas with different characters in different eras. Yes, it's called a samskara. I digested her words without speaking. Then I lifted my chin towards the Asian woman draped in gold. Who is she? Ah, Kuan Yin, the lady of boundless compassion. And we know from the Sophia Code, I, Kuan Yin is my favorite. Like that girl is my favorite. And I did not expect that because obviously Magdalene is part of my family. She's part of me, Magdalene. And I loved her part as well. But Kuan Yin took me by surprise. I cried my way through the Kuan Yin activation. So if you have not read the Sophia Code, again, go to the playlist in the description box below and you can find the Sophia Code of Kuan Yin. Wow, was her story powerful. She was born from the tears of an Avalok Shivara, a Bodhisattva from a heavenly realms. Her consort is Father Earth. He is said to have lived with her as the jewel in the lotus. Oh, she is like Ariel, I thought, the divine mother of compassion. I had heard of the Hindu prayer, Om Mani Padi Hum. This prayer literally meant, I salute the jewel within the lotus of the one. Contained within this phrase were also the seed symbols, Ma for mother, Pa for father, and Pu for human being. And this mantra started with the original seed symbol of the creation, Om. Isis, Mary, and Kuan Yin are the sweet goddesses of healing who nurture the world, Shasta explained. She then lifted her hand and her voice rose softly, softly modulated with power. I felt the energies in the garden shift and the plants seemed to quiver around us. Hail Kuan Yin, hail Mary, hail Isis. These, were these beings coming into the grove now, I wondered? We ask that you bless this one, your daughter, who has come before you seeking today. May you guide her in the right way and lead her on a path that is right for her and for all whom she touches. After a long moment, Shasta lowered her arms and drew me silently to the next altar. This was at the southern gate. The altar had two platforms, one higher than the other, and the bottom one was draped in a red satin cloth. Red candles formed a semicircle of light around a small globe of the earth and an empty turtle shell. There were also many seashells gathered here, along with the translucent skin of a snake. I didn't understand any of these symbols. Why would anyone have a dead animal skin and turtle shells on an altar? Whose altar is this? I asked awkwardly. Shell woman's, turtle woman's, Gaia's, the earth herself. The south is the altar of all great goddesses who come from the sea. This is the altar of the ground we stand upon. and It also honors the earth's oceans. White shell woman is the protector of the dolphins and the whales and of all the animals of earth. She lives in the South Seas with a turtle. A picture of Bonicelli's birth of Venus painting arose in my mind. Was she talking about Aphrodite? What did that have to do with the snake? Was it the snake from the Garden of Eden that had tried to seduce Eve? But if so, what was it doing here in the Garden of the Goddess? My mind was trying to catch up. I lifted my chin. What is the serpent doing here? Shasta smiled. That's Uchat Buto. Perhaps the most ancient of all the goddesses. She represents the kundalini energy of the universe. Kundalini energy is also Christ consciousness energy. This is the chai that runs up the spy, spine, moving through every one of the body's energy centers until it reaches the forehead, the seat of the inner sight. In its tra untransformed state, it is a serpent that must be conquered, concerned with survival issues only. But in its awakened state, it is a spiritual initiate who has embraced the kundalini life force and harnessed it for knowledge. Uchat Bhutto represents life, death, and transformation, part of the natural cycles of earth. Like the Uraburas, the snake biting its tail, Uchat Bhutto symbolizes the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the ending of all things. Egyptian legends say that this goddess existed before the gods and goddesses put together. Okay, a serpent. Well, it was certainly a different interpretation from the Adam and Eve story I had learned in Sunday school, but it did, did, but did that make any of it less valid? After all, 
Weren't these all just symbols or parables for the archetypal principles that move through the universe? So I guess the ancients used the snakes because it was the only animal that shed its skin while it was still alive. It seems like a perfect symbol for being born again. Along with the rising kundalini energy through the body, it was one of the most ancient symbols for the initiate's path, life, death, release, and rebirth. And didn't the medical symbol for healing have two snakes entwined around it? This came from Egypt. I knew it represented the male and the female nervous system that ran up the spine, also known as Sanskrit as the Ida and the Pingala, which are your two nostrils, which we have talking about with yoga. So I'm going to tell you guys my theory on the Adam and Eve story, which has changed over time. As I study more about Kundalini, I've been studying Kundalini for a long time, for almost 16 years now through my yoga journey. And I do understand it to be Christ consciousness. And we do understand that Kundalini is represented by a serpent that is at the base of your belly. So right between Mulabandha, and Udiyanda Bandha, like right in this area, there is Kundalini, right? Right here, okay? And as you start to awaken, that Kundalini energy starts to run up your spine, Shashumna, not the actual spine, but the Nadi. And so my thing is, especially studying the role of twin flames, we know that Eve came from Adam's rib. For me, this is metaphoric, that these were two twin flames. They were the divine feminine and divine masculine of one soul being. Now, we also know that in most cases, the feminine energy, the divine feminine is the one to activate the male. So usually the feminine will find that Kundalini before the male does. And if it is a tantric type of activation versus a singular activation, then the woman will activate the man through the act of sex, basically. Okay. And so that is how I see the Adam and Eve story now too. If you read the um, Apocryphon books, which are the, some of the missing books of the Bible, we've read them on my channel before. Um, they, they taught early Christians taught the Adam and Eve story very differently. They taught that Adam and Eve were confined in a jail cell with Lucifer. And so the awakening through the serpent was what freed Adam and Eve out of that jail cell that Lucifer had put them in. Okay, so that's just a totally different perspective. And this was taught in the early Christian faiths, right? So do your research. Very, very fascinating. Very, very interesting. These two currents crisscross at each of the seven major chakras of the body. Yes, and the seven major energy centers of the world of spirit connects with the world of matter. Prakriti Purusha, the Shiva Shakti. Right. We spoke about that last week with um, Emmy and Stephanie. I'll link that video down below if you missed it, because we did speak about this. OK. The spiritual masters teach us that in order to fully activate our mastery, we have to first clean out and activate all seven chakras. Then we can balance the yin and the yin currents within us. The mind flashed back to the pharaohs. Didn't the rulers of Egypt wear a serpent at the front of their crowns. Maybe they were trying to say that they had activated their Kundalini and acquired this mystery. Hmm. Maybe the mystery of the serpent was deeper than I had thought. And again, if you've been on this channel for a while, you know, we've talked about the Ak Moses tablet. We know that the Bible has been, been rewritten multiple times. And we know that Moses was a dark sorcerer. That's what the name Moses actually means. Um, he was practicing black magic. If you read the Ak Moses tablet, uh, it was the Egyptians who were practicing um, worshiping one source creator and Moses and his cohorts, which are now considered the um, Kazarian people controllers um, were practicing black magic and they were worshiping the Elohim, multiple gods. And so everything's inverted, literally everything's inverted. And so, yes, I agree with that. The Egyptian, I'm more fascinated in the Egyptian studies now because those seem to be the ones that are actually aligned with God and not Lucifer. So, the uh, 12 tribes of Israel from Abraham. Abraham was a Luciferian. He did practice human sacrifice and he did. Um, and Jacob, who was Israel, those are the 13 bloodline families. The 12 tribes of Israel for the good side are Galactic, Kentuckian, Palladian, Lyran, right? Invert everything. Very fascinating, very interesting. This is why the controllers don't like me this is why i have a target on my back all right healing and human biology next shasta drew me towards a western gate and i saw the cat-headed egyptian goddess that i had glimpsed so long ago in her living room what is her name again i asked shekmet she is the galactic goddess she didn't come from our world at all apparently not i thought to myself sizing up her strange cat head she didn't look like anybody i'd ever seen 
but I could well imagine that there were many kinds of beings on other planets that look different from us. And why not? Human life could have arisen on another other worlds and been blended with other species besides primates. After all, if alien visitation reports are true, then there is an isolated type of human out there as well as a reptilian species and several variations of the human type. Why couldn't there be a strain of feline humans as well? The Lyrans are considered to be feline um, lion. That's why the Lyran group carries the Christ consciousness. That's why in a lot of uh, de depictions of, of Christ, we see the lion, right? And so that's the cat too, the, the feline. Shasta raised her brows. I am a priestess of Shekhmet. Oh, I said softly, tell me about her. She smiled quietly and I wondered just what she was thinking. Legend tells us that once long ago, the gods summoned Shekhmet to, to cleanse our planet of genetic abominations created by the scientists in Atlantis. When the gods could not subdue the half-human monsters, they asked Shekhmet to do it. According to the stories, she wiped them out and protected Earth. Thus, she is considered both a warrior and a protectress. Shekhmet was known as a great healer in Egypt. And even today, her small temple stands behind the great temple of Karnak in Luxor. And she is very much alive on the inner planes. Do you have this power to heal? I mean, Shasta assumed a cryptic expression. All priests and priestesses develop some kind of healing ability. This is a natural attribute of women. We are by nature life givers and nurturers because the divine mother lives within us. I wondered then if she was speaking of something hidden within our genetics or merely a principle. But before I could ask, Shasta went on. The cosmic mother has been revered in cultures around the world long before the patriarchal gods were even born, Trisha. This is because each human being's biological origins is always female before it is male. That I knew. When a baby is formed in the womb before it is male, it is always female. That's why men have nipples too. It's because the nipples develop before the male uh, uh, genes, uh, hormones take over. Okay, so that I knew. What? I raised my eyes in astonishment. What was she saying? Look it up. I'll show you the references. I don't understand, I stammered. Please say it again. Biology has confirmed that every living creature begins as a female. All mammals are biologically female first. Becoming a male is an added hormonal development. My mind reeled in disbelief. How is this possible? This was the exact opposite of what we have been taught in the Bible. In fact, this was one of the man's greatest claims to superiority. that They have been created first. Judeo-Christian theology teaches that Adam was created first in the image of God and that Eve was taken from Adam's rib almost like an afterthought. Actually, Lilith came first. So we don't even really know the full story of the Adam and Eve story. This is one of the many justifications that the male-dominated church has used for centuries to make women feel that they were inferior and created just to do a man's bidding. If science actually reveals that we were all began as biologically female, then the patriarchal religions have been lying all along. They have completely subverted the natural order. What they told us was a fabrication designed to manipulate women for their own political purposes. How could this theology continue to be taught if it contradicted a biological fact? Shasta was st still speaking. Long ago, human beings knew that everything was born of woman. So the great mother was honored as the creator of all. This is why they called the, the heavens the Milky Way, the source of the mother's milk. They knew that everything emerged from her. Egyptians referred to her as Hathor, the cow goddess of milk and honey, a term meaning night in French. Nut is the mother of the starry skies. It is in her body that we travel after death through the sea of the galaxy. And even before the creation of the heavens, there was none, the primordial ocean of mercy. Years later, I would discover that this ancient Egypt Egyptian description of the cosmic ocean is a realm where scientists believe there is no polarity, where atoms are squeezed so tightly that the electrons are pushed out of their orbits and can move around freely, a place beyond all polarity. In Egypt, none was this great cosmic ocean from which all beings arose. It is undefined, undifferentiated energy before creation. Shasta continued. 
It is from Mother Earth that everything comes, every piece of wood, coal, iron, or wool, every animal and planet. But our society has forgotten this. When we dishonor the mother, we dishonor all that holds the universe in balance. We were now standing at the Western Gate and I saw a large wooden medicine shield nailed to a post. It was painted black and red, and the altar below was also black. There was a large spider web on one side of it. The West is the place of women, Shasta explained, the place of hidden power. It is the seat of the secret societies, the mysteries, all that it is hidden. So we paint it black like the secrets of wisdom contained within the black Madonna. It is the vessel of life that is veiled from sight. Although the patriarchy has tried to destroy her, the priestesses of Isis have long been the caretakers of these secrets. This is where the deepest mysteries were passed from mother to daughter, generation to generation, a vast lineage of underground wisdom. In later years, I was to realize just how true Shasta's words were. The source of all great spiritual tradition flowed from the wisdom cultures of Egypt, India, and China. And as this wisdom spilled out into the world, it had birthed the mystical teachings of the Druids, Mayans, Essenes, Greeks, Sufis, Magis, Kabbalists, and the Gnostic Christians and Rosicrucians. It had also influenced the inner teachings circles of the Native Americans. But the Age of Darkness fell, and the secret st stream had been nearly strangled by the church. The world had been steeped in religious wars, book burning, and ignorance, and the deeper te teachings had been forced underground. Long ago, the wise teacher Thoth, god of wisdom in ancient Egypt, had predicted this fall in a hermetic writing called the Lament. There will come a time when it will be seen that in the vain have the Egyptians honored the divinity with pious minds and with a studious service. All their holy worship will become inefficious. The gods leaving the earth will go back to heaven. They will abandon Egypt. This land, once the home of religion, will be widowed of its gods and left destitute. Strangers will fill this country, and not only will there be no, no longer be care for religion, religious observance, but a yet more painful thing will be laid out down under so-called laws, under the pain of punishment, that all must abstain from the acts of piety or cult towards the gods. And that writing also kind of goes into is Georgia where I live, the original Egypt. And just so you guys know, we are going to be talking about Thoth and the golden tablets, or excuse me, the emerald tablets. Thoth and the emerald tablets. We are going to get into that eventually on this channel as well. Who would preserve this knowledge once it was lost, I wondered. How could we reclaim it today? I realized then that there had to be people like Shasta out there, people like me, souls who were actually the reincarnation of ancient in initiates alive in our time. They had begun to awaken their own memories and recaptured what had been lost through all centuries of death and destruction. Was this the reason that the priestesshood of Isis had called me years ago? Over time, I was to learn that as the destruction of each great civilization approached, the mystery school sent initiates into other lands to set up centers of wisdoms in place around the globe. But again and again, the powers of politics, greed, and ignorance had sought to wipe out these streams of wisdom so that now all that remained were the broken fragments of legend and crumbled stone. I knew intuitively that this deeper wisdom was somehow woven into the hearts of the goddess. And if we only had the keys to decode her symbols, we could awaken to the wisdom behind them. But in those early years, I did not yet know the language of the hermetics that had been taught by the masters, nor did I nor did I realize that there were other spiritual initiates who still honor the divine mother, even in the mystical orders of the patriarchal societies. The last gate. I followed Shasta solemnly to the last gate, trying to absorb the truth behind her words. We are now in the North gate, the place of the teachers. She said a white wolf pelt lay over the cool white alabaster slab, a bleached skull call skull rested on top of it and statues of white, Angels flanked it on all sides. I was deep in my own thoughts and did not speak. After a moment, Shasta began. The North is the place of the teachers. It is the home of the masters, the wise ones who oversee our planet. It is the home of Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, and Mamet, the goddess of truth. It is the abode of the Arctic wolf and of the white buffalo woman, the star woman who brought the balance to the native people. It was she who taught them how to commune with the spirit world in the sweat lodge. She who taught them to dance in their prayers around the tree of life and the sun dance ceremonies. And she who brought the sacred pipe to the tribes. 
Who is white buffalo woman? I asked. The name seems strange and mysterious to me. The star woman who teaches the balance of life, that all things are part of the same great circle. All my relations, the four-footed, the winged, the tree people, the stone people, the balance of all kingdoms. She knows that we must honor the balance of the wheel of life or we will destroy ourselves. I absorbed the power of these words in silence. When I did not speak, Sasha took me by the hand. Come, let us talk now. Let us steep through the pillars of initiation and take our seats in the place of the eternal silence. She led me quietly through an archway that I had not noticed before. It was covered in greenery, and I imagined that in the spring it would be full of roses. We settled onto a nearby bench close enough to the circle that I could still feel the pulsing of the will. Now, Trisha, she said softly, tell me what it is that I can do for you. I am ready to study with you, I said without preamble. Shasta sat in silence for a few minutes, choosing her words with care. Good. Then I will convene a circle. I teach only women, you know. I teach only women, you know. She, I was not surprised. This will change our relationship, she said following me. I will no longer be your friend. I will be your teacher. I know that you have been trained in other paths, but you will become a novice to the goddess now. Then if you wish, you may take your vows to become a priestess a year and a day after the training is complete. I nodded, taking this in. We will begin in late winter. Go for all four seasons. How else can you learn to live the life of a priestess if you do not mark the yearly changes? The question was rhetorical. We will also meet on the eight holy days. I will give you a schedule. Shasta stood up and embraced me then, kissing me on each cheek. I could already, already feel our relationship shifting. In the meantime, you might want to take some time away from your busy schedule to do a little bit of research. You're certainly going to need it. And since it has been a couple of weeks since we've posted with this book, I am going to go ahead and cover chapter five today. I know this is going to make this episode a little bit longer, but obviously you can pause and come back. If this is a good place to pause, if you need to go do something, come back and then um, pick it back up with here with chapter five. All right, chapter five, the circle convenes. To the one who comes forth from heaven, hail, do we say. Loftiness, greatness, reliability are hers as she comes forth radiantly in the evening. A holy torch that fills the heavens. Her stance is like the moon and the sun. On the earth, she is enduring mistress of the lands. February 2nd, Bridget's Day. I could just make out Shasta's cottage against the gloomy indigo twilight sky as I parked on the dead-end street led to her house. Inside the windows, I could see candlelight twinkling through the windows. Tonight was the first meeting of the sacred circle, and I was nervous. As I made my way slowly up the shadowed walk onto the side wooden porch, I could feel my heart beating in my chest. I opened the front door to see a cheerful fire blazing in the fireplace of the living room and candles illuminating altars in the corner of the room. In front of the merry crackle of the winter's fire were dozens of women seated in a circle on the floor. They looked up as I entered and smiled, and I wondered whom I might know in the circle. I took my seat quietly on the large open cushion that was waiting for me, feeling the deep magic of the house enveloping us in its arms. You are in perfect time, Shasta said, indicating that we should all go around the circle introducing ourselves. My eyes registered the long feminine skirts and shawls that many of the women wore, but I was dressed in leggings, boots, and a sweater, my normal garb for the winter's day. This show of graceful femininity was quite a change from the male-dominant world of photography and advertising that I was used to in my daily life. Even as a clairvoyant who did readings for others, I always dressed in a particular non-girly way. Like many people I knew, my life seemed to straddle two worlds, my Clark Kent world of photography, art direction, and advertising, and my spiritual world where I helped other people in need through my readings. As I entered Shasta's living room, I counted 13 women in all, 12 around the one teacher. That was the same number that Jesus had used, putting himself at the center of the circle like the sun in the middle of the 12 signs of the zodiac. Interesting coincidence, I reflected. Wondering if the number of women gathered here had been deliberate or a divine act of providence. Actually, Mithra had 12 disciples in Jesus's Mithra. Yeshua had about 70. But we do know that 12 people plus one leader is a coven. And I don't want that to scare anybody because there are good witches, witches out there too. Again, as I've talked about before on this channel, um, as the Navajo used to teach, a black witch, a dark witch, uses dark black magic, is someone who bends nature to his or her own will. 
a white witch or a light worker is someone who helps people move with the will of God and the will of nature. All right. So that's the big difference. As the ladies began to introduce themselves, I learned that these were intelligent, articulate women who ranged from homemakers to directors of multinational companies. There was Meg, a short, slender blonde, who worked as a liaison in international affairs in Washington, D.C., Claudia, a stylist makeup artist from Los Angeles with an Emmy Award under her belt, Susan, a sexy sales representative, Donna, an accountant, Alexis, a shy tomboy with freckles, Emerald, a large, overweight head secretary to law form, and Sarah, a bright massage therapist and a singer. They were all smart, attractive women who had been on their own spiritual journey for many years. Sophia, Isis, and Mary. We'd finished our introductions. Shasta greeted us warmly. Welcome to the cir circle of the goddess. Tonight we begin a journey into the heart of the mysteries. This path is a journey of self-discovery, not only about ourselves, but about the hidden history of our planet. The goddess teaches a path of the heart, a path that all life is sacred, and that the intelligence that moves through the universe moves through each of us as well. This path honors the living energies of the earth and the spiritual beings behind the cosmos. It honors the energetic connections between all people, animals, and how we are all linked together by a symbolic web of light. As she spoke, I could feel the connection with my inner senses, not only to the women in the circle, but to all the people I love, no matter where they lived across the planet. Throughout the centuries, the goddess has been known by many different names in many different cultures. In Christianity, she, call, she is called Mary, the great mother of compassion. In Judaism, she is known as Sophia, the goddess of wisdom. In India, China, and Japan, she is Lakshmi, the mother of gener generosity who dwells in the great cosmic egg with Vishnu, her eternal mate. She is also Saraswati, the goddess of creativity, and Durga, the vanquisher of demons. She is named Pravati, the mother of the universe, and Kali, the great transformer, who rules the cycle of death and rebirth. In China, she is embodied in Kuan Yin, the bodhisattva of children. And in, J in Japan, she is Emartusa, the goddess of the sun. I hope I said that right. These are only a few of her many names. Shasta looked around the circle. Our eyes were wide with wonder. I had never even heard of most of these goddesses, although I had seen pictures of a few of them. Honoring the goddess was the first theology of our ancestors. They believe that the creator of the universe is female. But in the last few thousand years, people have forgotten who she is. And so now the world has fallen out of balance. Our path is about remembering her place in creation and restoring balance to the world. Emerald and Meg were nodding. The path of the goddess teaches us to attune to the invisible world of spirit and the connection behind all that we see. To become a priest or priestess, a healer or a shaman, is to learn to walk between the worlds. To become a med mediator between the realms of spirit and the realms of mortals. It is not about leaving the physical worlds behind or denigrating the worlds of matter. It is rather about seeing the sacred worlds of spirit beneath the visible worlds and rejoicing in it. This physical body is the vessel we are given in this life to communicate with the seen and unseen forces of the divine. And long ago, it was believed that the female was the natural mediator between earth and sky, the physical and the spiritual realms. Thus, we are about to establish a conscious partnership with the divine and learning to take responsibility for our own lives. In the end of this path, in the end, this path is also about discovering that the divine spark within every creature and with every one of you. Her words fell into the deeper place within me. The goddess gives birth to all that lives, and she takes back into herself all that ever was. She shows us the cynical patterns of life and regeneration, and she is forever in a state of change. Thus, the Indians called her changing woman, for she rules all the cycles of time. We women have all the same characteristics as the goddess. We bleed, we give birth, we nurture the unborn, we tend to the dying, and we celebrate the many natural transitions of life. Yes, I thought, birth dates, graduations, funerals, and the birth of children were all things that my mother had honored, even though I sometimes forgot about them. And holidays. My mother was the first to call the family together around Thanksgiving, Christmas, or Easter dinner, or send a thoughtful card or gift to a nephew's graduation. That is very, very true. In Egypt, she is known as Isis. She of 10,000 names and 10,000 faces. The female I am principal of the great mysteries. Her true name is Atset. And her husband, the husband was Atstar, the, the ancient name for Osiris. Isis was also called 
Ainhu, the term meaning high dove, and Isa, the first of all created beings. She was a sister, daughter, mother, wife and widow and queen. When she fled from the darkest forces that swept Egypt during the reign of Set, her evil half-brother, she even became a refuge. Then, along with her young son Horus, Isis became the savior goddess whose cunning and insight helped to rescue Egypt for the, from the 350 years of darkness. Our faces were wrapped with attention. We could almost see the images of that her world painted, and I felt that Isis was so real, so easy to relate to, as if she could have been any one of us. Isis lies within every woman, and every woman is Isis. For we each have the potential to experience all these aspects of ourselves. Daughter, sister, lover, wife, mother, and wisdom keeper. Isis established the first mystery schools in Egypt, and then assisted by her father, Father Thoth, her husband Osiris, and later her courageous son Horus, these teachings were brought to other lands and cultures. When Osiris was murdered by Set, Iris brought up Horus in secret so that he would one day be strong enough to ta challenge his uncle. Those who followed her became known as the Sons of the Widow, one of the titles still used by Freemasons even today, because we know the Freemasons have taken everything and inverted it. So I hope you guys understand that. Again, darkness cannot create anything, only the light can. So everything we have was created by the light and inverted by the darkness. The sons of the widow, I pondered the depth of what the phrase implied. It seemed to excuse it seemed to exclude the sorrow of her loss and the spirit of her husband as an eternal presence beside her. The spiritual temples of Isis taught that there is one great creator behind all the many faces or facets of God and goddesses, and that the divine spark that dwells within the gods dwell within us as well. The mystery schools taught us that this is the balance between the male and the female that brings us to mastery. If we neglect either side of our natures, we cannot achieve it. But because the Divine Mother has been forgotten for so many centuries, this garden is dedicated to her. The light from the fire danced across her face as we drank in her words. For over 7,000 years, Isis was worshipped in temples across the world, from Egypt to Britain, Rome to Turkey. She was the faithful wife, the courageous mother, the great queen, the gifted healer, the wise teacher, and the great civilizer. Over the last two millennia, she has continued to be honored as Mary Magdalene, another widow who once married a great world savior. And we know Isis temples exist here in America. They're in the Grand Canyon. Tennessee is the, the land of, of Isis. There's a Tennessee, I'm sorry, there's an Isis temple at the Norris Dam in Tennessee, which we have covered on this channel. I'll leave a link to that down in the description box below. A collective gasp echoed through this room. Mary Magdalene, what should she have to do with Isis? As you will learn, Mary the Magdala or Mary the Great was trained as the pre in a priestess of Isis in the temples of Egypt. Exactly. But Mary was not of Magdala. Again, we've covered this. Magdala, she was not from Magdala. She was from Egypt. And Magdalene came through her mother's line. Mary, or her name wasn't even Mary. Her, her name was just Magdalene. Mary was a kind of a Jane Doe name they gave women to strip them of their identity. Her name was literally Magdalene. And um, we know that Magdalene was blonde hair, blue eyed. We know that her mother was Kentuckian. It came through the Kentuckian line. So she had the secrets of the Celtics as well as the Egyptian. And yes, she was very much raised in the priest and priestess of Isis, as was Yahshua, the Christ. The knowledge of who she really was, the female equivalent of the partner of Christ, was forced underground by the patriarch patriarchy, although Jesus had called her the apostle who knew the all. Yahshua, again, Jesus is Mithra. All of us in the circle seemed to be holding our breath. In all the great temples of wisdom, there were always two levels of learning. The outer are lesser mysteries and the inner are greater mysteries. In the Christian teachings, Peter was entrusted with the outer mysteries, while Magdalene was the teacher of the greater ones. But these teachings of balance between the masculine and the fem feminine in her role were suppressed by the Orthodox Church. And because of that suppression, the two true secrets of mastery are largely unknown to us today. You could feel the entire circle exhale, and my mind began to race. At the time when I first began to study with Shasta, Shasta in 1985, the Gospel of Philip had not yet been published, nor had many of the hidden Gospels discovered in the writings of the Dead Sea Scroll been published. Margaret Starbird's The Woman with the Alabaster Jar and Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code had not yet been released. These books examined the revelations that Magdalene had been the wife or spiritual companion of Yahshua and had been entrusted to impart his deeper wisdom in the years after the crucifixion. 
I don't, again, believe the crucifixion happened. There's many supporting evidence to say that no, Yahshua was actually never crucified um, because that's a human sacrifice for Lucifer, not for the source God. In the Gospel of Philip, we read about how Yahshua used to kiss Mary on the mouth and that his love for her was deep and abiding. Of all of his disciples, he loved his companion Magdalene the most and kissed her. The disciples asked, why do you love her the most? He answered, when a blind and sighted man are both in darkness, they are equal. When light dawns, he who can see will know the light. He who is blind will stay in the dark. We also know that Yahshua and Magdalene were twin flames. They were the same soul. They were both of the Christ. Yet at that time, this was a totally new concept and largely unknown to the world. My mind grappled to understand the meaning of Shasta's words. Like Isis, Magdalene became the Black Madonna, the hidden goddess of wisdom who must reemerge so that the world might return to balance. I will have to learn more about this, I thought, wondering how I could begin to discover the hidden history of the Magdalene. Later, I would learn that the Sons of the Widow was a title used by the early Gnostic Christians, followers of Yahshua and Magdalene. Both Isis and Magdalene had been widowed through the loss of their enlightened husbands. Shasta lifted her chin, directing Emerald to sit, stir the fire. The popping of the logs sounded loudly in the chilly room. When the fire had begun to burn brightly again, Shasta resumed. We will speak more of these subjects in the months to come, but tonight we will begin our year of study on the eve of Candlemas, one of the eight high holy holidays of the year. Shasta picked up an unlit box of candles beside her, passing it around the circle. We each took a candle and then passed it to the next person. In the Celtic world, February 2nd was the festival of Bridget, a triple goddess with three major forms, the maiden, the mother, and the matron. Bridget governed the arts of healing, knowledge, and architecture, and smithcraft. She was also the patron goddess of writing. Her temple at Kildare in Ireland had clear running springs and a fire that was constantly maintained in the temple by the priests and priestesses like an ever-burning shrines of Vesta, the Vestal Virgins in Rome. This fire was dedicated to truth, illumination, and knowledge. Shasta lit her candle and then reached over and touched the flame to the wick of the candles that Claudia held. Claudia offered its bright fire to Meg, passing the light around the circle. Later, when the Catholics could not get rid of Bridget, the bride, her history was rewritten by the church. She was turned into a Christian saint named Bridget, and nunneries were set up in her name. Worship of her became mixed with worship of both Mary, the mother, and Magdalene, since both women had spent time in Britain among the Druids. Bridget, the bride, became known as the Queen of Heaven, mother of my sovereign, prophetess of Christ, mother of Yahshua. Like the two Marys, Bridget was both a bride and a mother. The flame had almost reached me. I touched my unlit candle to Sarah's and watched the living flame leap up to my wick. Bridget's symbols are the sacred flame of illumination and the waters of eternal healing symbols that were also sacred to Isis. Shasha looked around the circle at the illuminated faces of women. Tonight, we light these candles for them, for Bridget, Isis, Mary, and Magdalene, the hidden brides whose light must be rekindled in this world. I had heard of St. Bridget in England. I wondered if she really was Isis, the widowed bride, and if she'd become Magdalene, the hidden bride of Yahshua. But whoever she had been originally, the church had rewritten her history, and through the rep repetition of her story, her original identity had been subsumed. It seemed as if the old adage, if you can't beat him, adopt him, was at work here. Or in this case, they had seized the energies of the existing deities and pretended that it was their own. Later, I would learn that this is exactly what the church had done with many of the ancient deities and temples, having seized over 500 temples to the ancient mother across Britain, France, Italy, Greece, Germany, Spain, and Portugal. They had even done this in Egypt and throughout the Mediterranean, using the original temple locations where the ley lines of the earth crossed to harness their power for themselves and rename them in their new religion. Ding, ding, ding. This is the Great Awakening, right? Most of these centers had been dedicated to the mother of all, like, like the Chartres Cathedral in France, once a place of worship for Isis and Horus. Now they were dedicated to Mary and Yahshua or to Magdalene. Well, at least they still acknowledged the sacred feminine, I thought, even if they had maligned it. I reflected on how Bridget's holiday fell in the winter season of darkness when Native people must have despair, despaired 
of ever seeing the sun again. Bridget was the brighter hope and light. Perhaps now when the world was, has forgotten the light of the feminine face of God, we could help her to return. Shasta was speaking again. We light candles to Bridget in a way of affirming that despite the seeming darkness, we believe that the light and the love and truth will return and that all people of the earth will one day awaken from their spiritual slumber. It seemed to me that our tiny flame symbolized the hope of women everywhere and that there would soon come a time when women were not beaten, marginalized, or oppressed. Our candles in that tiny room were like the kindling of hope. The light would dawn once again for women across the world, and with it, healing would come to earth. Let us go around the circle now and share a blessing for the world. Claudia spoke first. I just wish that people were kinder to one another. We took a breath. That would be nice, I thought. Kindness and tolerance were not so easy to come by. Meg lifted her candle. I wish that women could be treated fairly across the world, not made to hide their faces with burkas, and face fails and be forced to have and forced to have clitorectomies, which are like circumcision for women. I had heard of this barbaric practice among the Muslim nations. Many men in Africa and the Middle East continue to force their daughters to have their sex organs of pleasure surgically removed so that, that would, they would be only good, be good for serving the man's pleasure, not their own. It was a horrible custom and it took away a woman's enjoyment of sex. Furthermore, they had convinced the older woman to do it to their own daughters as if it was for their own good. Barbaric. Sarah spoke next. If I could wish anything, it would be to put it in to sexual slavery. Children are sold into slavery every day across the world and women are kidnapped and forced to become prostitutes to serve men and then die. This has got to stop. Holy smokes, this was getting deep. As bad as things sometimes seem for women in the free countries, there were a million times worse for women in other parts of the world. Emerald spoke next. I just want to get equal pay for equal work, if you know what I mean. We all laughed. Leave it to a legal secretary to bring things back to the basics. Susan spoke next. I would just like to offer my blessing to all the women who have been abused by men through domestic violence. The runaway girls, the beat of wives, and the girlfriends who are too afraid to leave their boyfriends because they don't have enough self-esteem. Yes, I knew that the statistics show that a woman is RAPD somewhere in North America every 13 seconds and does not include the countries where women are more oppressed. Statistics from the U.S. Department of Justice show that the intimate partner homicide make up about 40 to 50 percent of all of the murders of women in the United States. I took a breath. Now it was my turn and I wasn't even sure what I wanted to say. I had always been the tomboy in my parents' house and had refused to let myself be defined by what being just a woman meant. I would like to give a blessing to people like Shasta who are carrying this ancient knowledge forward and who are here to share it with us today. I know my words were lame next to all the amazing things that other women had said, but they just felt right to me. If Shasta were not around to make us aware of another perspective, then we might not even realize that the things that were happening to women in the world were essentially wrong. This information was critical for us to awaken. I barely heard what the other woman said as we completed our ritual. When we were done, we put our candles into holders at the center of our circle, then took a deep breath. Tonight, I wish to share some of the percepts of the goddess path, Shasta said. As you begin to exa examine your own belief systems, you may want to consider these. Several of the women pulled out notebooks, but Shasta stopped them. No, just take this in and let it live within you. We put our pencils down. First, the path of the goddess teaches us that we are each responsible for our own spiritual development. You are responsible for deciding who or what the divine is for you and forming a relationship with that presence. No one can do this for you but yourself. Like all relationships, this takes time and effort, but you will find that what you put into it is what you will get out of it. The more time you spend in nature, in contemplation, or in self-discovery, the more quickly you will grow. This means that the path of enlightenment is up to you. I nodded. I had already discovered that the constant chatter of our daily lives continually tried to pull us into mayhem and distraction. By creating an altar in my home, I was reminded to spend more time cultivating this active connection with spirit. Shasta continued, The path of the goddess teaches us that all things contain a spark of the infinite, and thus all beings are sacred. 
Since consciousness can communicate with consciousness, each part of the whole can communicate with every other part, whether we are talking about a plant, an animal, a rock, or the elements. These parts often cooperate with one another to accomplish very specific ends, like the spirit of the herbs for healing or incense for sacred ceremony. Our thoughts can interface with everything around us, the stars, the moon, the earth, the elements. By honoring their sacred gifts, they can assist us in our journey. This is an interactive process. She paused to look at us. Are you following me? We nodded afraid to interrupt her train of thought. The path of the goddess also embraces the belief that consciousness survives beyond death and that nothing of spirit is ever really lost. Exactly. Energy can never be created or destroyed. It can only change. Matter converts to energy and back again, the fundamental discoveries of the physicist Albert Einstein, E equals MC squared. We grow, we evolve, we change, yet our souls are eternal. This is the wisdom of the changing woman who rules the cycles of life. When we die, we open a door into another dimension and we pass into it. When we are born, we open a door into this world and we return to live in a physical body. This was taught with the mysteries of Greece. The lesser mysteries were dedicated to the divine mother and daughter. Demeter and Persephone. The second level of the mess mysteries were dedicated to the father and son. Do any of you know the story of Demeter and Persephone? Shasta looked around the circle. Several of the women shook their heads. Wasn't this a story about how the Greeks explained the four seasons? I thought in fall and winter, per Persephone descended into the underworld. Then in spring and summer, she returned to her mother Demeter, who was so happy to have her daughter back that spring would come into bloom. Myths and stories are tales used by the ancients to encode a deeper level of knowledge, because even in the, if the meaning gets lost, the story would be remembered. While the, while the uninitiated know only the surface meaning, the initiated understand the real significance behind the legend. So when we seek to understand a goddess or her wisdom, we begin by learning her story. In this tale, it is also helpful to know that Persephone was also called Kore, the small seed that falls from the wheat shaft, and the seed that is the innocent virgin of potential that lies within inside of us, the kernel that comes from the tree of life. Hmm. The tree of life. A subject I would have to explore in more depth. In the Greek story, Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, was out in the fields picking flowers one day when suddenly the ground opened up around her. Hades, the lord of the, of the underworld, emerged with his golden chariot and 12 black horses. Swooping up the innocent maiden, Hades carried her down into the underworld. Demeter, not knowing where her daughter had gone, searched everywhere but could not find her. Over time, she grew sick with worry, so the plants began to die. For one full year, the earth fell into drought, and eventually even the gods themselves were suffering. They petitioned Demeter to bring back the bounty of the earth, but without Persephone, Demeter had no reason to bring back the earth's bounty. Eventually, Thoth, or Hermes, the Greek god of wisdom, told Demeter that Persephone was in the underworld, and Demeter demanded that Hades release her. But because her daughter had eaten the six red pomegranate seeds during her year of captivity, the gods decreed that she must remain in the underworld for six months of the year. The other six months, she could return to her mother in heaven. Shasta looked around the circle. So what is the meaning of the story? We all exchanged glances. The only thing that I could think of was that I had been taught in high school that this was how our ancestors explained the seasons. Some of the other women made heartfelt suggestions, but I could see from Shasta's stillness that we had not decoded its meaning. At last, she sighed. This is a metaphor. This is a metaphor for each of us, a parable about our cycles of rebirth. Rebirth, what did she mean? Half of the time we live in heaven with God, the mother. The other half of the time we descend into the physical world and forget who we are. Ah, this was a metaphor for the evolution of the soul. Our war world is in the realm of light and shadow. The underworld, a land of illusion and confusion. We are living in the underworld today. When we return to our mother, the queen of heaven, we return to the realms of celestial light. Oh, I had never understood this parable before because I'd always thought of God as a male. Wow, it had been right in front of me the whole time. What do the pomegranate scenes represent, Claudia asked. Shasta looked around the room. 
Does anyone have any ideas? Were they good seeds or bad? I wondered, was Persephone supposed to eat them or not? At last Shasta answered, they are the seeds of karma that each of us sow when we come into this world of shadows. This took a moment to seek in. The seeds remind us that we can trap ourselves in this world through fear and desire, and thus we must, we must return to be reborn on the wheel of life. Donna and Alexis shifted in their seats, perhaps thinking of actions that have bound them to the wheel. The seeds are sweet, but they can also bind us to the great wheel of Awaganwan, the wheel of life, death, and rebirth. She let the full minute go by while we, while we digested this. Shasta unwound herself from the floor. Now let us get up and dance. We will dance our joy that we are here on earth at this time and that we are waking up. Let us experience the sweetness of life without being bound to the wheel. So in the ceremony, we will return to the pomegranate seed to the center, symbolizing our liberation from past karma. Slowly, we all got to our feet. Shasta picked up a blanket of rattles and passed them around. Then she turned on some music. I took a rattle and began to dance, not sure what I was doing. But as the music seeped into my, my blood, I began to move into an altered state. We spun in circles around the room as the chant moved us on. Dissolve the seeds of time and space, return them to the light with grace. Remember who we've always been, reclaim the, reclaim the soul that lies within. Bring light into the world of form, that who are might be reborn. I felt the spirits of other dancers, time out of mind, who had been here before us. Finally, Shasta brought us into a sacred circle again, when the dance was over and we laced our arms around one another's shoulders. Tonight is a good beginning. In the months ahead, I encourage each of you to learn more about the Divine Mother and her history, which has been hidden from the modern world. We will meet again in four weeks' time, just before the season of Ostara, the ancient mother of rebirth. The time of new beginnings. In the meantime, I suggest you do some reading and find some answers for yourself. I looked around the circle feeling blessed to be amongst such wonderful sisters. In the goddess tradition, Shasta said, we close our circle by saying, the circle is open, but unbroken. Mary meet, Mary part, and Mary meet again. Blessed be.